what I thought I'd do today was to talk about the, the Earth's deep carbon cycle, as you can see, and some of the work that um, that I've been involved with, uh, with some PhD students and other colleagues around the world uh, over recent years, the last 10 years or so, I guess. Um, uh, I'm trying to understand uh, how carbon is recycled uh, deep into the earth and then back out again in various different ways. And so we've basically using constraints based on mantle xenoliths, uh, synchrotron measurements and other types of analytical measurements and high pressure experiments. Um, so we're gonna basically have a bit of a journey of carbon from uh, subduction into the deep mantle and then back out again. Not covering all the complexities because it's a very complex business, but, but just some of the pathways. So we, we know that carbon uh, is a, obviously an incredibly important element in the earth. It's the basis of life, um, but it also exists in the interior of the earth uh, in all sorts of different forms. And, and some of these are uh, displayed here. Uh, diamonds are the obvious ones. Carbonatite melts. This is an experiment showing immiscible carbonate melt and silicate melt. Increasingly important as we move to uh, uh, more sustainable energy production, electric vehicles and so forth. Uh, there are even uh, carbides, iron nickel carbides in the in the deep earth, um, beautiful gem quality calcite crystals, and of course CO2 in the atmosphere and in other fluids and magmas uh, in the deeper earth. So carbon exists in a variety of forms. Um, everyone is aware of the, the sort of shallow or uh, more or less, I guess, exogenic or surface carbon cycle, where carbon is cycled in various forms between the atmosphere and the oceans, uh, the lithosphere, the biosphere, and so forth. And of course, this has received a lot of attention in, in recent years because that essentially mitigates uh, climate. Uh, and we know that, uh, you know, anthropogenic uh, additions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere are actually changing the climate. So this is the shallow carbon cycle operating uh, on a time scale of thousands, hundreds, thousands of years, maybe a bit longer. But the deep carbon cycle, is much slower, much deeper, operates on time scales of probably hundreds to millions of years, uh, and so is responsible for uh, a lot of um, processes in the earth, um, probably contributes to um, long-term climate change as well, or I, I won't be um, going into that. So what I wanted to do today uh, in terms of the outline of this talk is, is to talk about the journey of carbon from an alteration product in uh, oceanic um, crust uh, to subduction in the four arc region and the sub arc region, and then very deep, even as far as the mantle transition zone, and then to examine how carbon returns to the surface. Now, there are many ways that happens, and I'm going to focus specifically on kimberlites. That's not volumetrically significant, but it's nevertheless interesting because of the association with diamonds. Uh, and some of the processes that go on in the deep cratonic lithosphere. Um, so that's basically where we're going. Um, and as I said before, this is mostly work that's been done by um, various PhD students that, that myself and colleagues have supervised, um, but also some colleagues um, here and in other universities. And a lot of the impetus of this came from the advent of the, uh, the Deep Carbon Observatory, which was a, a US, a 10 year US program uh, that, that recently concluded um, was funded privately by the Sloan Foundation in the US, and that enabled a huge amount of research in, in this all aspects of carbon in the earth, uh, including particularly this sort of deep carbon uh, type work. So that's part of the impetus for, for much of what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so we're going to start in the four arc region. Um, we know that um, uh, you know this is a, a section through the earth. Um, we have some oceanic lithosphere. We know that oceanic lithosphere gets altered by hydrothermal processes near the ridge, such that it contains some amount of, of carbonate, usually calcite, but other uh, siderite and other carbonates as well. Um, concentrated mainly in the upper few hundred meters of the oceanic crust, the mafic oceanic crust. Um, but you know, it's a, a maybe three weight percent calcite equivalent, something like that on average, it's a bit hard to be sure, but there are various estimates of that order. And this carbon carbonate gets subducted along with the oceanic lithosphere at subduction zones, uh, focusing on the four arc, first of all, which we sort of consider to be 
uh, the region less than 20 kilobars and probably about 600 degrees or 700 degrees. Um, if this is a section through a, a, a typical subduction zone, um, as I said, we know that the oceanic crust contains uh, a few weight percent of carbonate that gets subducted. Um, there are all sorts of estimates about how much, what the flux of carbon into the, into the deeper earth is as a result of this, but it's currently estimated to be around 40 to 115 megatons per year of carbon being subducted as part of oceanic crust at subduction zones. Um, and we currently estimate that there's around about 18 to 43 megatons per year of carbon uh, being emitted through arc volcanism um, each year. Um, of course, that's an extremely, or both of these are extremely rubbery figures because they're difficult things to measure. But nevertheless, it seems like there's a fairly large imbalance between what goes in and what comes out uh, at the magmatic arc. Um, so that suggests that other processes must be happening. Uh, maybe carbon is being subducted very deep, um, surviving the, the, the arc processing um, and, and, and maybe it's being stored in other places as well. Um, so under the four arc conditions, which as I said, less than two gigapascals and less than about 700 degrees, we believe that um, this corresponds to this sort of serpentinized cold nose, which is this little wedge in here, uh, which is more or less isolated from the general convective um, uh, overturn of the mantle uh, above the subducting slab. And we believe that that, that, uh, that um, serpentinite or antigorite can actually be can actually be carbonated by fluids that are coming off the uh, subducting slab. So these um, carbonates in the oceanic crust can release fluids, uh, water and CO2 bearing fluids, uh, probably based on thermodynamics and some experimental work with roughly mole fractions of CO2, roughly 50-50. Uh, so they're roughly 50% water, 50% uh, CO2, you know, within some sort of range around that around that area. And so uh, we conducted an experimental study with my student, Melanie Sieber, who finished a couple of years ago, um, to look at the nature of this, uh, um, this, this carbonation of serpentinite um, in the four arc region. And uh, basically she, Melanie, did a series of high pressure experiments. Some of them were powdered experiments using a natural antigorite sample from, from the, the Swiss Alps. Um, and she, she crushed and ground that uh, into a fine powder. Uh, ran that with a, a CO2 water fluid generator, which is basically oxalic acid, uh, which breaks down under the conditions of the experiment to produce CO2 and water. Um, added some trace elements to that as well. And she ran them at one to two gigapascals and 550 to 750 degrees Celsius. Um, so these are uh, four arc type conditions. Um, and she was able to map out the phase relations uh, of this system as a function of fluid composition. And, and one of the, the key advances in this study was that, that Melanie was able to measure the composition of the fluid, the equilibrium composition of the fluid um, after the experiments had been run, uh, basically by piercing the capsule, which contains very small amounts of free fluid, of CO2 and water fluid, into a gas chromatograph, uh, with a particular system we've got here at ANU. And she was actually able to measure the compositions of those fluids, which doesn't sound like uh, much, but it's actually quite a significant achievement um, in, in experimental petrology to be able to reasonably precisely measure fluid compositions like that. And so this is the results of the experiments. Um, so first of all, we have a, the, the black lines on this. This is temperature against the, the composition of the fluid expressed as mole fraction of CO2. Um, and uh, the black lines are a thermodynamic model um, for antigorite. Uh, this is the, the chemical system here at two gigapascals uh, over that range of temperatures, 400 to 800. And you can see the antigorite is only stable when the fluid is, is very poor in CO2, so basically close to pure water. Um, but as you add uh, more and more CO2, you, you can convert that antigorite into an assemblage of um, talc plus magnesite through a reaction like this, so antigorite reacting with CO2 producing magnesite and talc and, and releasing some water. Uh, and at even higher mole fractions of CO2, the talc will react and convert to magnesite and silica or quartz um, and water. And so that was what was thermodynamically predicted. And if you stare at this diagram with the experimental results long enough, uh, 
you'll see that basically the experiments uh, confirmed the thermodynamic, thermodynamic prediction quite well. So, so this is a sort of a, a you know a model or a background uh, for for understanding how serpentinite is serpentinite is uh, carbonated in, in that system. She then did a bunch of experiments where we took a, a core um, of this serpentinite, this antigrite, so just cored out a, a, a cylinder of this stuff. It's probably about a centimeter across. Uh, ran it again with the, the um, oxalic acid in a in a fairly large silver capsule. Uh, at these pressure and temperature conditions. So again, four arc conditions. And then it enabled us to look at um, fluid transport mechanisms and, and some uh, information about reaction rates. And this is, it's a complicated story. And so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but Melanie's published all this in the last couple of years in, in two or three um, papers, which if anyone's interested, you're welcome to look at. Uh, she did a time series at 600 degrees and two gigapascals. Um, and so there's the sections through through the cores in those in those four experiments, and um, the green areas are unreacted serpentinite. Um, the yellow areas are magnesite talcum quartz. So this is where the carbonation has happened, and you can see that as time 12 hours 24 96 192 as time has gone on, uh, we've replaced more and more of the serpentinite, and in fact this is a remarkably rapid process. I mean 192 days. Uh, that, uh, sorry, 192 hours, that's eight days. Uh, we've replaced the majority of the serpentinite in that, and this is a natural serpentinite sample. So it's not like we're using a sort of super fine grained experimental material. Um, so it seems to be a, a, a very rapid process happening, even though the temperatures are relatively low, um, that, that replacement or carbonation of the serpentinite. And if we look in more detail um, at these areas, um, sort of you know, outlined here, she used the technique called XMAP tools, uh, which is an electron microprobe based technique, which allows you to map the distribution of phases uh, in the experiment. And so in this 12 hour experiment, she's got uh, a layer of quartz and magnesite. So this is where the fluid was initially very CO2 rich and it re reacted uh, along the, the margin of the, of the capture and along fractures, replacing some of the antigrite with, uh, with magnesite and quartz. And then as the fluid uh, as the carbon dioxide in the fluid formed magnesite, the fluid became more water rich. And, and so we ended up with um, uh, some talcum and, uh, and some magnesite replacing the antigrite in these interior regions. So clearly the fluid is able to move into these uh, interior regions. And by the time we get to 192 hours, we've <clears throat> got almost complete replacement of the antigrite by this sort of carbonated assemblage. Um, uh, going going through uh, the the, the antigrite, um, so it's creating porosity in the reaction zone. So XMAP tools allow you to, to calculate the sort of bulk density of the different assemblages from this uh, magnesite rich zone uh, into the the magnesite and talc zone, and then this, the unreplaced uh, antigrite zone. And you can see that the um, you know there is a, a significant change in density from outside. Uh, towards the serpentine, which is creating porosity and allowing those fluids to, to interact. So in summary for that part, if you have high CO2 in the fluid, the antigrite will, will react for magnesite and quartz. Um, that will decrease the, the mole fraction of CO2 in the fluid. Um, the fluid will become more water rich and the solubility of quartz in a water rich fluid will increase. Um, and so eventually we'll have magnesite reacting with water and, and aqueous um, dissolved silica to form talc and CO2 um, or talc and water. And then at lower mole fractions of CO2, we can replace the serpentine by talc and magnesite uh, to form talc and magnesite. So the antigrite, so that's down in this area, um, the antigrite is reacting with CO2 forming magnesite and talc. So basically the interaction between a, a CO2 water fluid and serpentinite will produce um, these magnesite quartz, magnesite talc, and magnesite antigrite assemblages at two gigapascals and 600 degrees with decreasing CO2 in the fluid. Um, carbonation of the serpentinite, it, it forms metasomatic reaction zones, sort of perpendicular to foliation in the serpentinite. So the fluid transport was favoured in veins. Um, and it also, there was a porosity created, which allowed um, it to percolate in and react. And importantly, it seems to be a very rapid process. And so we sort of speculated that this could result in the sequestration of quite a lot of carbonate in that four arc um, sort of nose 
underneath the four art part of mantle wedges. And this has not been accounted for in estimates of carbon fluxes um, into the mantle subduction zones, but it, it may be important, which is wrong way. And we do see it in, in nature. Uh, it's in the, the uh, Zermatt SARS region um, in Switzerland. Uh, so we see, you know, talc plus carbonate magnesite veins alongside serpentinite. Uh, mimicking uh, what we what we actually observe in the experimental um, study, so it seems like it's likely to be a real process. Um, uh, so it hasn't been factored into into these models for for carbon recycling. Okay, so so we can account for some of the missing uh, volcanic CO two, uh, maybe by by sequestering it in in the forearc, but. Some carbonate presumably gets subducted deeper into the subarc, so the higher pressures and higher temperatures. Um, and to look at that, um, this is an experimental study that I did quite a long time ago in uh, Frankfurt when I was a postdoc uh, working with Gerhard Bray. And so we, we uh, produced a, a carbonate bearing eclogite composition, um, no water in this case, uh, and ran that composition at 2.5 to 55 gigapascals. So this is um, you know, corresponding to the subarc pressures of the subarc region, so deeper than the forearc and higher temperatures. Um, and we were able to show that this produces carbonatite or carbonate melts, which you can maybe just see in this interstitial material here. It's a bit clearer here in this experiment where you've got higher degrees of melting and nice quench carbonate melt. And here we have lots and lots of carbonate melt uh, in between all these residual carbonate, carbonate grains. So that, that was the first demonstration that, that a carbonate eclogite, the first melt that it'll produce um, is, under anhydrous conditions is, is a carbonatite. Um, if, if we then compare uh, the, so the phase relations of this, there, there's like pressure temperature plot. Uh, here's our solidus. Um, below that we have our eclogite plus a calcite dolomite solid solution as the carbonate with or without a little bit of coazite in some cases. Um, across the solidus, um, we, we begin to melt the carbonate um, and uh, produce that carbonatite melt. Um, it's essentially um, a product of, of solid solution between the silicates and the carbonate um, forming sort of dolomite, which then melt to the minimum on the, on the calcite magnesite join. Um, which is why the, the melting temperature of the carbonate is relatively low. If we compare the, that solidus and the solidus is for carbonated basalt or eclogite from a number of other studies that have been done subsequently, um, they're all quite different, but that's mainly related to differences in the bulk chemistry. Um, if we compare those soliduses with typical slab geotherms, um, which are these dashed curved lines, this is sort of an estimate of a very hot one, um, and these are estimates of some, some real um, subduction zones, as you can see. Um, the key thing is that the, the eclogite, carbonate eclogite soliduses are higher than reasonable slab geotherms. It's also true to a slightly lesser extent for carbonate bearing peelite, which might also be getting subducted at subduction zones, and also for carbonate bearing prototype, where, where the solidus is, uh, is somewhat higher up here. So it seems like uh, along most arc geotherms, um, carbonate in basalt, eclogite, or in peolite uh, will survive without melting, um, and it may actually be subducted beyond the subarc regime into the deeper mantle. That was the major conclusion. Of course, uh, that ignores um, any role for, um, for water. Uh, if we have water-rich fluid circulating around, they will have some sort of solubility of, of CO2 in them and could transport some carbonate away from the, uh, from the slab and into the, um, into the overlying uh, prudotite wedge. But that's a bit of an open question at this stage uh, as to what the compositions of those fluids might look like. Okay, so if we accept that carbonate can be subducted deeper than the, the, the sub-arc region in, in, in this area um, and maybe can be subducted uh, towards the mantle transition zone, which is the layer of the mantle between 410 and 660 kilometers, uh, where we have um, transformations from alpha olivine, normal olivine into wadsbyite and ringwoodite, so sort of high pressure forms of olivine. Um, and so another student, uh, Kate Kisieva, who's now um, at the University College in Cork, um, conducted a, a, a very high pressure experimental study, nine to 21 gigapascals. So this is from the deep upper mantle 
into most of the mantle transition zone using a multi-anvil apparatus. Uh, we won't go into all the details of how those experiments are done, um, but I'm happy to explain that later on if anyone's particularly interested. Um, and these are the phase relations she got. So she used a morb type composition with some carbonate added to it, uh, calcite added to it. And she got, um, this is pressure along here, temperature up here. Uh, here's our 410 to six, well, that should be 660 kilometer uh, mantle transition zone in this region. This is the upper mantle, this is the lower mantle. Um, and essentially the assemblages that she got at, at these different pressures were garnet CPX and some accessory phases, a little bit of a sort of a rutile type phase, a bit of coazite. And at high pressures, she got some potassium hollandite, stichovite, garnet. So the CPX is now completely dissolved in the garnet to form majorite garnet. Um, and some, some carbonate, this is alkali bearing magnesite and coazite. Um, and then at the very highest pressures, we've got garnet, cal calcium silicate, perovskite, stichovite, potassium hollandite and some coazite. And remarkably, the solidus is quite flat. It's at around about 1200 to 1250 degrees over a, a tremendously large pressure interval, which is quite an interesting observation. Um, there was another study done subsequently um, by some colleagues at Bristol University, uh, and their results were a little different in that they got this um, famous nose in their solidus. Um, so, but roughly, you know, similar orders of magnitude in, term, in terms of the temperature of the solidus that they obtained as uh, to, the, uh, to Kate's study, but they got this sort of bend in the solidus, double bend in the solidus, so quite a complex solidus shape. shape. And, and the difference really relates to um, compositional differences in the bulk composition. Kate's composition was quite calcic, and that influences the behaviour of um, the high pressure carbonates um, and how much of, of the alkalis that those carbonates can, can accommodate. Um, nevertheless, for both studies, um, if you compare those soliduses with um, uh, slab geotherm, so there's a hot slab surface, um, average slab surface geotherm down here, you can see that the conclusion is that, that it is unlikely that carbonate bearing mafic um, compositions are going to hold onto their carbonate into the deep part of the mantle transition zone. They're going to melt in the deepest part of the upper mantle, here's, here's 410, and 660, 600 kilometers here, so this is the transition zone. They're gonna meet in the uppermost part of the, the sorry, the, the deepest part of the upper mantle or in, in the upper part of the mantle, mantle transition zone. So the carbonate will melt uh, and it won't be transported deeper um, if, if the slab indeed is able to, to penetrate the mantle transition zone and, and move into the lower mantle. So we sort of have a, a barrier to the subduction of carbonate, um, but that's the conclusion that they reach, that most carbonate on most geotherms is unlikely to go any further than the mantle transition zone without melting. So the question is, what happens to it when it melts? Um, we know that carbonatite melts in the mantle are extremely mobile. Um, they can segregate from their sources at very low melt fractions, amazingly low fractions of a, of a percent. Um, they have low viscosity, uh, they have low density, so they're able to move in the mantle. It's like squirting WD-40 onto a rock. It just soaks in um, very effectively. They're able to wet the surface of silicate minerals um, quite effectively, and so, so they, they can migrate uh, very quickly uh, through, through silicate um, matrices. So what happens if these carbonatite melts migrate from subducting slabs into the prudotite wall rock at sort of lower, lower part of the upper mantle and into mantle transition zone pressures. Essentially, this depends on oxygen fugacity in the mantle. So how oxidizing or reducing the mantle is. Um, and the, the current thinking on that is that, that as you go deeper into the mantle, this is increasing pressure along this axis. Uh, this is oxygen fugacity relative to the iron woolstite buffer. As you go deeper and deeper, oxygen fugacity decreases um, along a curve like this. This is thermodynamically calculated, this red curve. And at about somewhere around eight, nine gigapascals, you reach the nickel precipitation curve. And at that point, we get um, iron metal or an iron nickel alloy segregating from the mantle, mainly due to the disproportionation of FeO into iron metal and Fe2O3. And it takes the nickel with it. So, so at this point, um, a metal exiles and then 
after, thereafter, deeper levels, uh, the oxygen for gasoline is buffered by this iron wustite, um, so Fe, FeO buffer, okay? Now that's the thermodynamic calculation. Um, the reason for this is that the molar volume of, of the reactions that sort of control the oxygen for gasity, like, like this one in mantle assemblages, are such that as you go to higher pressures, you, you, um, you decrease the oxygen for gasity. Um, if we look at mantle xenoliths, uh, this is a study from Alan Woodland uh, at the University of Frankfurt. Um, he's measured the oxygen for gasity on some xenoliths from the cupole craton, kimberlite born xenoliths, garnet prototypes. And you can see they follow that curve quite nicely. So, so the natural samples, at least for this lot, seem to agree with the uh, with the, um, the the thermodynamics. Now, the key thing here is this reaction as well, which is the so-called EMOG, and this is the reaction which limits the stability of carbonate in this FO2 pressure space. Okay, uh, this is calculated for temperatures along a cratonic geotherm, and so this is enstatite, magnesite olivine or forsterite and carbon and oxygen, okay? So any, any condition above this reaction, carbonate is stable, but down here at oxygen for gas is below that reaction, then carbonate is not stable. Uh, the, the stable form of carbon will be graphite or diamond, depending on the pressure temperature um, that you're at. So for most of the, the lithosphere, the cratonic lithosphere, at least from, from about, you know, roughly four gigapascals, uh, sorry, roughly two and a half gigapascals, and down, carbonate will not be stable. So we're unlikely to have carbonate in that, in that deeper part of the mantle. It's gonna be, uh, carbon is gonna be in the form of, of carbon. And that applies right down to, you know, um, the, the mantle transition zone uh, at, at sort of pressures approaching 14 gigapascals or thereabouts. So uh, that means that if a carbonate melt segregates from this subducting slab, and percolates into this reduced metal saturated prototype, it must uh, reduce, get reduced to carbon, to, to graphite uh, and, and other sort of silicate minerals around that area. So, so we'll store the carbon as, as, as diamond uh, or carbide if it reacts with the, uh, the iron metal and that would certainly happen. And then uh, eventually in some way, uh, these uh, domains of sort of metasomatized diamond or carbide bearing material could get convected back up towards the surface uh, where they'll progressively encounter uh, more and more oxidizing conditions until at some point diamond will become unstable, carbonate becomes stable, uh, the carbonate might melt and form a carbonatite or a, a carbonate bearing silicate liquid. So, so this redox change, this redox freezing and then redox melting um, is what's been proposed um, as a way of getting the, the carbonate back up, up to the surface or towards the surface, towards the lithosphere. So if we then consider what happens when, when those melts uh, reach the, the base of cratonic lithosphere, for example, where, where kimberlites, um, are, or kimberlites are erupted from more or less, um, we have prototype xenoliths, kind of prototype xenoliths, which are samples of, of that deep cratonic lithosphere, and they record information about um, the redox conditions and the pressure temperature conditions through thermobarometry and oxybarometry. Um, and so if we can, uh, the redox conditions obviously control the behavior of carbon and can be calculated from, from the iron three content of the silicate minerals. So if we basically can measure the iron three in silicate minerals, we can estimate the oxygen for gasity and, and then predict how the carbon uh, is gonna behave. So we did this for a number of different cratons, but just highlighting uh, the central slave here where we have um, samples from Panda and Diavik, two diamond mines in the, in the central part of the slave craton. Uh, they cover a, a large section of the, of the cratonic lithosphere down to nearly seven gigapascals. Um, and they're beautiful garnet, spinel garnet, Hartsbergites and garnet lurzolites. Um, now, um, in order to determine their oxygen fugacity, uh, we have to be able to measure iron three in garnet because um, these reactions that I referred to before, uh, which are uh, redox reactions involving components in garnet, olivine and orthoperoxine have been calibrated experimentally. So if we can measure the iron three in the garnet, we can calculate the oxygen fugacity, which is over here. And in order to measure the iron three in the garnet, uh, it's quite difficult um, 
You can do it with a special technique on an electron microprobe called the flank method, but that's quite difficult to do. MOS power spectroscopy is the reference technique, but that's time consuming and requires quite a large amount of sample. It's sort of a bulk technique where you've got to separate out 20 or 30 milligrams of garnet from a prototype xenolith, and it can take several weeks even for one analysis, depending on, on um, the situation with the, with the radioactive source. Or we can go to the synchrotron and do zanes. And that's something that we've done at the Australian Synchrotron and also at uh, the Advanced Photon Source in Chicago and, and the ESRF in, in Grenoble, um, where we have, uh, just to um, rush things along a, bit, a little bit, we have uh, a, a set of synthetic garnets, which are um, solid solutions between almondite, which is the iron two garnet, Skiagite, which contains both iron two and iron three, it's a sort of a theoretical end member, and andradite, which is all, all of the iron is iron three. So if we, if we measure the amount of iron three in terms of iron three on total iron in those um, in those uh, species, they range from zero to one. So they cover the full range of iron three on total iron, uh, and we have solid solutions in between all of these end member compositions. And so what we do is to to take X-ray absorption near edge uh, um, structure spectra, spectra at the iron absorption edge of the synchrotron. And this is what those spectra look like for, for these synthetic garnets. Um, so this is just a, a whole series arranged in order of decreasing iron three on total iron. So from andradite at the bottom up to almondine at the top and all the solid solutions in between. Okay. And what we're looking at, this is the iron edge. So the major absorption edge for iron uh, here. This is the, the post edge. And we looked at this little feature here, this little pre-edge feature. Um, and you can see that's caused by certain electronic transitions uh, for iron within the garnet. And you can see that the energy of that peak moves very subtly to lower energies as iron three plus on total iron decreases. And so that enabled us to, that's the, the centroid of that energy against the iron three plus on total iron to construct a calibration curve for, for these solid solutions. Unfortunately, when we applied it to natural samples, which are also contain chromium and magnesium and other components, so more complex than these, we just got a, a shotgun scatter of random points and it was completely uh, of, of no use. Um, so, so these were standard samples that have been measured by Mossbauer and we were hoping that we'd get a nice um, straight curve that we could use as a calibration curve. Uh, fortunately, we found that some of the post-ed structure, particularly features at, at these two energies, the ratio of their intensities um, gave us a nice calibration curve. We don't know why or how, um, but these are the synthetic garnets. Um, this is the ratio at those two energies, um, 7161 and 7138 electron volts. Um, and you can see we have this nice, uh, this nice calibration curve. So then we can just measure um, the Zane spectra of any mantle garnet and use this calibration curve to estimate the, the iron three on total iron with a precision and accuracy similar to Mossbauer. And one of these measurements takes of the order of 20 minutes. So it's, it's quite a useful technique. So we applied this to the slave craton um, samples. Um, and uh, first of all, just before we get to the oxygen for gas, we're looking at their garnet chemistry. Um, so this is a pattern which is very common in, in cratonic lithosphere that we have a, a, some of these garnets. This is titanium and this is the pressure of origin of the garnets. This is your terbium. Uh, some of the garnets are very depleted. They contain very low abundances of titanium, your terbium and other elements like zirconium and hafnium. But when we get to about 4.5 gigapascals, we get this sudden increase uh, in the contents, the abundances of those trace elements. So uh, there's an enrichment which comes in very sharply at about 4.5 gigapascals. And these, we see this in, in numerous places, but these slave craton ones uh, are particularly um, a nice illustration of that. So, so we interpreted this as being a metasomatic um, overprint on sort of very depleted, uh, fairly, you know, fairly refractory um, prototypes. And then they've been metasomatically uh, enriched in the lower half of the, of the lithosphere. And interesting, when we measured their oxygen fugacities and plotted that as a function of pressure, so this is FO2 up here relative to another buffer, um, you can see that the depleted samples, which are these open symbols, fall in this sort of gray field, 
So that's our, our decreasing oxygen fugacity with increasing pressure that we saw before. But the metasomatized ones are much more oxidized by several orders of magnitude. And in fact, some of them uh, are so oxidized that they might actually have or be capable of having carbonate stable uh, in that assemblage. Okay, most of them would not have carbonate stable, it would be diamond, or you could have a carbonated silicate melt with a lower carbonate activity. Um, but in some cases, you could actually have carbonate stable. So, um, so it seems like the metasomatism is also, as well as enriching these uh, deep garnets in, um, uh, in trace elements and, and in some cases, major elements, it's also oxidizing um, those garnets quite substantially. So this has implications uh, for uh, kimberlites uh, because kimberlites probably come from these sorts of depths under the cratonic uh, lithosphere or near the base of the cratonic lithosphere. Um, kimberlites, as uh, I guess most people will know, are ultramafic rocks that are rich in CO2 and water and pretty low in silica and alumina with high potassium on sodium. Um, they're very difficult to pin down in terms of their composition because they're altered. Uh, they're degassed, um, they contain a lot of debris from the mantle and the crust that they've passed through because they're erupted extraordinarily violently um, into the crust. Uh, but they're interesting because they're obviously they're the major source of diamonds with the notable exception of argyle and also garnet prototype xenoliths. And they are the deepest known mantle melts. Um, so in some cases, xenoliths from greater than seven gigapascals in some cases, diamonds with inclusions that could only have formed in the mantle transition zone or the lower mantle. So these are seriously deeply derived melts. So they're samples of the deep mantle. And so we need to understand them to understand what's going on in the deep mantle. Uh, their radiogenic isotopes indicate an asthenospheric mantle source, um, but their origins are still fairly poorly understood uh, despite a lot of research over, over many years. Now, because I'm an experimental petrologist, I'll talk about some uh, briefly about experiments that, be, that have been done to try and um, understand how kimberlites form. And, and of course, one of the common ways of, of doing it is to melt prototype plus carbonate or prototype plus carbonate and water, uh, or sometimes with prototype and methane or other volatile components. Um, we know that from the Zenlith studies that probably most source regions actually to reduce the carbonate stability. Um, and also melting experiments, um, high pressure experiments on carbonate melts are really difficult to analyze because the carbonates quench into all sorts of weird um, mats of heterogeneous uh, metastable carbonate materials and they're very heterogeneous. And so the melt compositions that are determined from this sort of study uh, are really quite uncertain. Um, the other approach is uh, to do multiple saturation experiments where we try and saturate um, an inferred primary kimberlite liquid in peridotite phases. And if you can find a, a PT point at which uh, that primary kimberlite liquid is saturated in all of these peridotite phases, then you can infer that that's the origin uh, of the kimberlite that it formed by melting um, you know, at, that, at that pressure and temperature of a, of a carbonate bearing um, uh, kimberlite, uh, peridotite, sorry. But of course, we don't really know what the primary kimberlite liquid is because they're so um, you know, uh, messed up and weathered and full of volatiles and all the rest of it. Uh, and also the volatiles themselves, you can play around with, with changing the volatile abundance and, and the, the composition of the volatiles. And this has major effects on, on the liquidus mineralogy. So it's very difficult. And, and really in most cases, um, these experiments have not really pinned down um, the origin of kimberlites because there are just too many unknowns. And I think that the approach is, is basically uh, too simplistic. I think probably what's more relevant is a more complex um, system like this, where we have uh, pressure against temperature. Uh, and this is the prototype solidus varying as a function of oxygen fugacity. And so here's our lithosphere, asthenosphere boundary, our deep lithospheric cratonic mantle. Below that in the asthenosphere, we have a solidus which is reduced because it's in equilibrium with probably methane and water rich fluids. Um, this is where it's becoming quite reduced and quite possibly even metal saturated. So we have methane and water fluids here um, <clears throat> in this. So this is the oxygen fugacity relative to iron woostite. So it's quite reduced. 
uh, but it's increasing as we go to shallower pressures. Then near the base of the cratonic lithosphere, we have this metasomatic zone where it's much more oxidised because of the metasomatism, and we've seen that in the slave craton samples. And then in the more depleted, the rest of the depleted cratonic lithosphere, uh, we're back to more reduced oxygen fugacities, but steadily increasing as we go to shallower pressures. So that's what the oxygen fugacity profile looks probably roughly something like that from very deep through to the to the cratonic uh, through the cratonic atmospheric mantle. And so that means that the prototype solidus will change. So down here we'll have a reduced solidus, methane plus water prototype solidus. Uh, here we'll have an oxidized solidus where carbonate might be stable. And then up here we'll have again a reduced uh, 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 solidus which is uh, reduced with prototype methane type fluids. Um, the anhydrous solidus would be way out here at about 1500. And so we think that kimberlites form um, when you have um, upwelling reduced subsolidus prototype from greater than about 300 kilometers down here. It upwells, it reaches that reduced solidus, uh, melts in equilibrium with methane and water. Um, it, 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 the oxygen fugacity will, uh, will increase because we're decompressing this um, as, we, as we cross the solidus. Um, the degree of melting will increase as we move up here because we're increasing the water activity as we decrease the oxygen fugacity that the methane is being converted to diamond. And so that will lower the solidus and increase the amount of melt. And these were, melts would be expected to be magnesium rich uh, with relatively low carbon calcium and potassium, but we really don't have any experimental constraints or very few. Um, this is what they look like, very olive normative um, types of melts, but there are very few studies of, of prototype melting in the presence of methane and water bearing fluid. And that's something that really needs to be done, but it's actually experimentally fairly tricky. Um, and then as the melts move up, they would then interact with this oxidized zone at the base of the lithosphere. Um, and that would allow them to assimilate calcium, potassium, water, CO2, and increase the potassium and sodium towards the sort of levels that we see in kimberlites. And then after that, um, yeah, that's the oxidized zone that we actually observe in, 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 uh, in real xenoliths from, from this region, the sort of five, six, seven gigapascal depth. Um, and then the melts move on through uh, more reduced, less metasomatized lithosphere, um, they incorporate a cargo of xenocrysts and xenoliths, transporting them upwards to final eruption and placement in the crust. And probably the, the CO2 solubility in these melts, uh, some models have it decreasing rather rapidly at around 4.5 gigapascals for uh, kimberlite type melts. So this probably facilitates the incorporation of, of you know, fragments of the lithosphere and so forth and, and propels this stuff sort of very violently towards the uh, towards the surface for eruption. So, yeah, just going back. Uh, so that that's just one out of a myriad of different ways that we re can return CO2 to the surface um, after it's been recycled by subduction. And, and, and that's pretty much where I'm going to finish, uh, except with just a few, few concluding um, statements. So we think that the cold nose under the forearc may be able to sequester quite a lot of carbon. Uh, and that, that's an unrec previously unrecognized reservoir for carbon and, and flux of carbon from the slab. We believe that subarc geotherms are not generally hot enough to melt um, carbonate out of um, anhydrous um, carbonate bearing oceanic crust, although the effects of water are yet to be explored fully, but at least some subducted carbonate will survive the subarc and end up being subducted deeper. Uh, the lower upper mantle, mantle transition zone, and the upper lower mantle on most geotherms will be where this deeply subducted slabs of oceanic um, crustal material will produce carbonatite melts, but they will undergo redox freezing, forming diamond and carbides uh, when they contact with the very reduced peridotite down there. Um, and if that gets entrained in upwelling mantle at shallower levels where it's more oxidized, we'll get redox melting. Um, and you could form carbonatite melts or carbonated silicate melts. And maybe these carbonated silicate melts are what's infiltrating into the base of the cratonic lithosphere and may cause the oxidation and metasomatism, um, crystallized diamonds. And then uh, over a long time, that could precondition, precondition that deep cratonic lithosphere 
uh, for for later kimberlite or carbonatite genesis, where you need to have fairly oxidised conditions. Um, and that's just a list of people, uh, students. Uh, the, the red letters up here are students that have been involved in some of this work. A uh, whole bunch of collaborators from RSES, uh, Macquarie from Frankfurt Uni, uh, from the Synchrotron, at Australian Synchrotron, and the, the earlier Australian National Beamline Facility at the Photon Factory in Japan. Uh, some of the guys at UTAS and some industry people, and of course the ARC and the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung have all contributed in various ways. So thank you very much for your attention.